All right, and we're hot. All right, folks, welcome to the Team VTAC podcast. Or if you're on YouTube, I guess we're calling this the spun up <laughs> version of these. And uh, glad to have all you folks out there with us. Today, we got a guy, we, I, we were just talking about this before we went hot here just a second ago. 32 years in the military, he said he just was trying to figure out what he wants to be when he grows up. And I'm not sure he's even figured that out yet. <laughs> no, I'm, you know what? Uh, rodeo clown looks pretty good. Uh, <laughs> I'm still thinking Batman might be possible. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Doc Mike Simpson, man, it's great to have you. Great to be here, brother. Thank you. So just so people right out of the gate, I want them to kind of understand where we're going with this. I call you Doc. And if you were a, if you were an SF medic, I'd call you Doc. So you've been an SF medic mm -hmm. and you're actually a real doctor now. Yeah, I've got this. So I went from being as in the, they say in the movie, the green berets, I, I reckon I'm not the best doctor, but I'm the best one practicing without a license. So I was in that category. <laughs> And now I actually have a license, which really just means more accountability. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll uh, the reason we're here, your book just came out and uh, you wrote a book called Honed, Finding Your Edge as a Man Over 40. And you, we, I was on your podcast a couple months ago and you sent me a pre-copy of this and <sighs> it's upsetting. There's so many things I'm doing wrong <laughs> that you pointed out that I've got to get... You know, and I, I feel like, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing you should have maybe, maybe you should write another one for guys over 50 because I'm over 50 now, but most of this stuff I think applies at that age bracket too. But before we get into the book, could you quickly go through your 32 years in the army and, and just tell us about that? Yeah. Uh, so I raised my right hand uh, and took off. Well, actually, I raised my right hand before, when I was still in high school. I was on delayed entry, I think, like a lot of guys in our generation were. Uh, so I did a little less than a year on delayed entry program. And then two weeks out of high school graduation, uh, shipped off to the reception station in Fresno, California on an unassigned ranger contract, uh, went to Fort Benning. Fort Beginning, as we say, did infantry basic training, airborne school. We were still doing individual Ranger Battalion, uh, Ranger indoctrination program at the time. So <clears throat> shipped off to Savannah, did the RIP program. I was in the second to last uh, battalion RIP class. And I did four years in 175. I was in a, in a 90 uh, recordless rifle section there. Thought I wanted to do what a lot of Rangers did at the time. Of course, you know, this was... I, I'm going to say peacetime, but it was kind of the era of low intensity conflict. So, you know, and I was, I missed Grenada by a year and then nothing happened during my four years. And there was, we'd been promised every year that we were jumping in somewhere, whether that was Libya or somewhere else. And it never materialized. So I did what a lot of guys at that time period is I'll get out, I'll go in the SF guard and I'll be a, I'll be a cop. I'll be on a SWAT team somewhere. And I, I got a job in corrections, went into 20th group, uh, missed Panama, then got mobilized for the first Gulf War, but didn't go. We ended up just uh, doing an evaluation there at Fort Bragg and 20th Group. That's when I went to SF Selection, finished the Q courses in 18 Charlie, uh, decided, wow, I really miss active duty. So I went uh, went back on active duty, went to 7th Special Forces Group as an 18 Charlie, did about four years on a team as a Charlie, wanted another challenge, went to the SF medic course. <clears throat> I'm always in the, I'm always in the second to last something. I was <laughs> in the second to last, uh, Fort Sam Houston medic course, uh, before they moved everything to the Somp C at, at Fort Bragg. <clears throat> Did that, went back to my same battalion in seventh group. And then, uh, right around, it was actually late late nineties, early two thousands, I decided to finish up my undergrad with an eye to go into to medical school, wanted to be a PA, but they told me I was, I was too old and they wanted younger PAs because they wanted the, the branch to have a little more longevity. So did my prereqs, went to Campbell university, got my undergraduate, applied to med school. I was actually in the application process when nine 11 happened and went to medical school at the uniform services university, um, in Bethesda, Maryland, graduated, went to emergency medicine residency and then was fortunate enough to get offered what is 
absolutely the best job in the military for an emergency medicine physician, which is uh, the Joint Medical Augmentation Unit. So working directly with guys like you, supporting literally everybody who is at the tip of the spear, probably doing the most difficult jobs in the military and getting to be that medical piece. So, so guys like you knew that if something, God forbid, did happen, there were people there to take care of you. And uh, did that for six years before hanging up my spurs and then basically spending my last 18 months on active duty, um, getting MRIs and EMGs and uh, documenting all of the injuries that I had lied about so I could stay on halo status and stay on yeah. deployment status for all those years. And then it retired in 2016 out of Fort Hood and still live here in Central Texas. Man, I feel like a sissy now after listening to all that. Oh, come on. <laughs> all that stuff you went through. So we I just talked to a cat the other day, and one of the things I said was we we always get in this conversation about the training that you should have, you know, like where's your priorities of training? Mm -hmm. And I think I surprise a lot of people when my first priority of training is medical training. And I'll tell you, some of the guys I've met along the way have really pissed me off because this guy wanted to, he, he was a DEA guy, he wanted to bring in professional baseball and football players to talk. And he goes, well, I don't want to bring these military guys in because all they talk about are their failures. And it's like, bingo. Yeah. We talk we about from. failures because that's how we become better at what we do. And even before I went to Somalia, I, I, I wanted to be an 18 Delta, but I was already a 31 Victor. So when I went to the Q course, they made me a Camo guy. And I, to this day, I really wished I could have, I probably would have not made it through as a medic. You, you, did, a, you did done fine. God. I would have been given it a heck of a try there, but I always enjoyed the medical um, aspect of it. One growing up in South Dakota and trying to work on critters, which that sounds crazy too, but you know, we did all, almost all of our own doctoring on our animals there. We had a veterinarian that would come in if we need some serious stitching or something done. But um, medical training, man, is, it's number one. It's, to me, it's the most important thing that soldiers should learn because all the other stuff, you, you need to learn that too. But if you're on the battlefield or you're in training, or you're driving down the road as a civilian, guess what? You're going to get to use your medical training to try to save somebody's life. So, you know, that to me, that's one of those paramount skills. And, you know, that I would tell, I always tell guys then the next one is learn how to drive. And that sounds stupid too. But we, if you, if you have somebody that doesn't know how to be a, an offensive and defensive driver, when you're out on the battlefield, you're going to get to use all the medical training that we just finished, you know? Yeah. You have to be able to get out of trouble as fast as you got into it. Yeah. And with w going back to, uh, and I'm going to be all over the map here. We talked about this before too. We both have the same attention span as a squirrel. So it's going to be a little bit scatological the way that I, I go about this, but I'm lucky because I get to ask the questions and I get to get the answers of all the stuff I want to know. <laughs> um, how was it for you as a already you're a ranger you're sf all that stuff going to jmo how how was that different for you than for some of the other cats uh it was different i got treated differently by well i mean first that's how i got the job because at the time the deputy had known me since we were in ranger battalion together i was an e5 and he was a private who was that uh sean taylor Okay. Yeah. So Sean was a private when I was at E5. And then we crossed paths again in seventh group because I was at 18 Delta and he was my battalion surgeon. Uh, wrote me letters of recommendation to get into med school. Then while he was in residency, wrote me letters of recommendation to get into residency. Knew right where I was because he had basically mapped my career for me. And then uh, I was actually coming off of a night shift. Uh, I'm laying in bed. I had a couple of job offers for what I could do after residency. None of them were really appealing to me uh, for various reasons. So I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. And uh, get a phone call on my cell phone. It's identified as unknown because he's calling from his desk. And uh, 
pick up. He says, Mike, this is Sean. Do you know what unit I'm in? I said, yeah. He goes, do you want a job? I said, yeah. He goes, okay. And he hung up. <laughs> like, okay. That was really weird. And then about 10 minutes later, I get another phone call basically to arrange my travel to go out for an interview. And I did the formal interview process, but I think because I already had a reputation in the community, I'd already shown that I can suffer and that I can do some stuff yeah. that gave, that definitely gave me a leg up in the interview process. And I was, I was treated, I think a little bit differently by the more senior guys, the team leaders, you know, the PAs, um, but also with an eye to, Hey, you're going to have a little bit more responsibility. We expect a little bit more out of you because you've already done this stuff. So it was a little bit easier for me to hit the ground running as opposed to guys who might have come fresh out of residency, you know, gone undergraduate medical school residency, heard about this nebulous thing called the JMAO and, and applied yeah. and made it through the interview process. And then they get there and they're really trying to figure it out day by day. You know, for, for me, when they said, hey, we're going to X location to do training, it's like, oh, I've been going there since 19, 1984. I know exactly where you're talking about. Yeah. And, I'm, I'm familiar with, I'm familiar with the people that train there. Yes, I'm familiar with this type of operational package. I'm familiar with that type of operational package. I, I'm a former fast rope master myself. So yeah, I know how to do that without killing myself and already had halo wings. So, you know, just got back on jump status again. It was uh, different. I think it was a little bit easier transition for me than it was for some of the young, I call them kids, even though they're not kids, but some of the younger guys. Yeah, and I think, you know, I don't care what your background is. If you were a hockey player, a rodeo, or what, it doesn't matter. When you go in the military, it's a new ball game. And, man, we speak a different language. And, it, and the thing is, if you go work with the Navy, they speak a different language. And if you go work with the Marines, they speak a different language. Um, and Air Force, I think they speak the Queen's English. But um, Yeah, they're – they're a Fortune 500 company that just all happens to wear the same thing to work every day. Yeah, yeah. So, JMAO docs, just to so people understand, tell me, tell me if you were going to give me the elevator pitch of mm -hmm. what a JMAO doc does, mm -hmm. tell me what that is. I guess the elevator pitch would be uh, immediate and direct medical support to soft forces operating at the tip of the spear. So, that's uh, emergency medical support at the point of injury all the way up to and including damage control surgery. Okay. So let's, let's unpack that just slightly here at the point of injury. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? So the, the typical concept of how a physician works, I think if, if you ask most people who've never been in the military and people who've never been in soft, what, what does an army doctor do? They think of Hawkeye, right? So they think of, well, there's a, a bunch of tents set up somewhere and there's going to be field medics out that are going to be there when right alongside the infantry and the operators and they're going to patch them up. They're going to get into a field ambulance or a helicopter or some other mode of transportation. And then they're going to end up at this tent city basically. And that's where these doctors are going to do doctor stuff. But obviously for us, a little bit different. We're in full kit. I, I tell people all the time, if you would have, as we were lining up to get on an aircraft pre-mission, if you would have take a snapshot of that and say, which one of these is the doctor? Nobody would have known. You know, it's, you know, I, I get the breacher on one side of me and uh, the canine handler on the other side of me. And I was indistinguishable from anybody else. So I was there that in the unfortunate incident that somebody did get injured in, in an operation, obviously the, the medics typically are going to get there before me because they're right there, but I'm going to be there to provide a higher level of care. And if there's some type of mass casualty scenario to coordinate that, to coordinate multiple medics and ranger first responders or CLS providers, whatever it might be, and kind of run that mass casualty. So just, I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to draw a picture paint a picture here and you tell me if, if I'm wrong. So we, we get ready to go on a mission. We load up with where, what, you know, whatever package we're going to have, we fly, we end up swinging over a secure area and we land for a second and a bunch of these guys get off the bird and then we leave. 
and we leave a, a group of doctors out in the middle of a stubble field mm -hmm. in the middle of Iraq in the middle of the night. And it's not warm. You know, people think the no. desert is always warm. Well, it gets cold in the desert and we fly off. And after we fly off, you guys prepare to take care of people if they have to come off the battlefield and you're going to be standing by to do that. So now we go on the objective. We do our thing. Somebody receives a major blast injury. And, and by blast, I'm not explosive. I'm not talking a, a gunshot wound. They receive a major blast injury where their leg is almost completely severed. And the SF medic that's there and the troops are major. The, the troops are major gets the medic to the right location with the team. The medic starts to work on this cat. And he says, if we don't get him out of here soon, he could lose life or limb. Mm -hmm. So the Rangers go out and they posture on a, a HLZ quickly because the Rangers are the best at that. They're, I mean, they're the best at many things, but pretty much whatever we needed, they could make it happen really, really fast. Mm -hmm. Rangers secure an HLZ. We bring in the bird. Bird lands, get the casualty on that bird, get the medic on there with him if we can. If not, if it's a medevac bird, the medic will stay on the ground and the medics in the bird will start to take over. That bird now flies back to that stubble field, which could be five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes away. You know, hopefully it's close, but that bird lands in the middle of that field in the middle of the night. There's no, this isn't like a, a, a there's no lights, there's no nothing. And they drop this casually off and the JMAO docs are all standing around a table that they've set up using headlamps with the rifle slung across their backs and they try to save our mates lives. So yeah. is that a pretty accurate picture? That is an accurate picture. And, and you're describing something that I know you've seen firsthand, obviously omitting some key details for security purposes, but yeah, let me, let me continue, let me continue this story too, so that, that people get a, a even a better understanding. When this casualty went on the table, they said, if we don't, if, if we don't reroute the blood through his leg, he's going to lose his leg. Okay. He's stable. We're going to save his life. He's good. Mm -hmm. But we're going to, if, if we could reroute the blood through his leg, we could save the leg too. That night there was a vascular surgeon on staff with J Mao. And he did that in the field in Iraq and save that dude's leg. So you know, not to, I'm not trying to give you a reach around or anything here. What I'm saying is we, the guys on the ground, what, what do you think that does to our mentality? Uh, my hope would be that it gives you a sense of security moving forward that six months down the road, a year down the road, you're on an operation, you're about to make explosive entry into a, into a door and you don't know hundred percent what's behind that door. But you know, if God forbid something does happen to you, the assets are poised and standing by that everything possible within the realm of modern medicine will be done to save you, to save your limbs. And I hope that gives the operators a sense of security, knowing that we're, we're there. We, you know, we don't, I don't like to use the term security blanket uh, because it, it kind of minimizes the detailed aspect of it, but uh, I hope that that's the impact. Yeah. And I, I'm going to take it even a step further. I would call it for me, you call it security. I call it a peace of mind. And I think the, the reason I have a peace of mind when I would go into harm's way, it wasn't just because of the JMAO. Let's back it. Let's, let's go back to pre-deployment. I had a will. Now that's going to sound horrendous to say that, but it's the truth. Mm -hmm. If you have a will, you know that if something happens to you, your family's going to be taken care of, period. Yeah. That's what that's for. It's peace of mind. Now we get on the ground. We know that we have the 160th flying us onto the objective. <sighs> Need I say more? They're yeah. the best rotary wing pilots in the entire world. So there we go. We have peace of mind. They're going to put us down. They're going to, they're going to do everything they can to get us into the right location. You're on the ground with the best team of dudes you could ever be on the ground with. And you've got SF medics there, which I mean, I can't say enough good things about an SF medic. And then if something does happen, that further peace of mind is if anything happens, the JMAO docs are standing by, that's the next level of care that we were going to go to. So it's, it, to me, it's a huge benefit 
to free up the mind of an operator on the ground just to do their job because doing our job is not an easy job and doing your job is not an easy job but you don't need to worry about the breach on building one you need to worry about okay if somebody gets jacked up are we prepared to receive you know receive these guys right here so anyway i wanted just to paint that picture because i think that some people don't understand the importance of the other pieces of the puzzle everybody's like oh i was this in the unit oh i was a seal and i was Okay, let's look at the logistics behind that. Just logistics. And I'm not even talking about support, support uh, direct support personnel like y'all. I'm talking about just logistics to put a one team on the ground in a foreign country. I can't even get into that because there's so many things that you don't even think about. Yeah, you don't, I don't even think we could compute the dollar amount involved oh, no. in that. Because yeah. the, the train for that dollar amount in training, preparation, outfitting – not just what they bring to the fight, you know, not just the dollar amount on all the bullets they're carrying that day, but the bullet that they fired a year and a half ago in training and the, the fuel that that pilot has been expending for decades to become such a master at his craft that if the laws of physics allows him to land somewhere, he will in fact land there safely and then take off again. And all the logistics, all the direct support, like we talked about, you talked about dog handlers. You know, when we first got dogs, I was like, dogs that's stupid and by the time i retired i'm like well just give me a dog i'll i'll go in that if i got a dog with me i'll go in that building by myself i, I mean I, that's not the way to do it but those dogs were an amazing tool there yeah. to uh, make it happen anyway that i just wanted to further dig into what jmal was all about because um there's a couple of people on the battlefield that you probably won't hear many operators talk bad about one is the CCT guy, right? Because you love the CCT dudes. Oh yeah, and now they're they're using PJs as well. But at the time, we only took CCT guys with us, and those guys were just the masters of everything, you know, that we needed. Um, the medics. Now the medics are weirdos, but but they're we don't talk bad about the medics either. And then JMO. And uh, anyway, I want to move on. A little bit there to talk about your book so that lays out kind of where you come from you've this isn't a book that you just made up you you've lived this so can you kind of just walk us broad brush strokes through this book yeah so this kind of dates back to before we want let me interrupt you real quick right. where where can we get this book first of all uh it's on amazon it's on barnesandnoble.com basically any online platform where you become accustomed to, to buying books, it's available and it's available in uh, hardback, softback and uh, ebook. Okay, perfect. Um, we talked a little bit about kind of the unconventional path that I took to becoming a doctor, which obviously meant that I was older when I went to medical school and I was, I was 40 years old when I was an intern. And that was really the point you know, 40, I guess, is kind of officially when you enter middle age, I guess maybe it's 45. I don't know. But I was certainly starting to feel it working 24 hour shifts, uh, working long shift work, multiple days without any time off, not being able to necessarily eat right because of my weird schedule. And I noticed it really taking a toll on me all along in residency, knowing that, hey, when residency is over, I'm my goal is to go back to soft, to go back to the operational military. So I need to be in shape for that. And my body was not cooperating. And that was really when I started having to do the, the hard research into how do I need to approach exercise differently? How do I need to approach diet differently, recovery differently? And that's when the research for this book started it was, was 15 years ago for me at age 40. Uh, when I finished residency and, and then got into the JMAL and had to keep up with 18, 19 year old Rangers, then it became even more important because now it just wasn't a passing my twice a year PT test or passing the PT requirements to get into the unit. It's, uh, am, am I going to be the weak link and the difference between mission success and mission failure? And, and I wasn't at all prepared to be the cause of mission failure. I just wasn't going to let that happen. Um, so that's when I started laying the groundwork for it. And then over time, I just figured out that 
I wasn't the only person on earth that had these questions. A lot of people had these questions and I'd get emails because of my podcast. Um, I'd get approached on it. Uh, colleagues who noticed that I kind of seemed to have it figured out would ask me about it. And I say, you know, I just need to put all these down on paper. Everything that I've worked so hard to figure out as far as what I need to be eating, how I need to be working out, what supplements I need to take, how to get a good night's sleep, how to recover after a hard workout. A lot of people have these same questions and I need to give this to them in, in a format where they can reference it whenever they need it. So that was really kind of the, the impetus for, for putting it all down on paper. The, the, the thing I find interesting about this is it's, you feel in your mind, like you're still that 20 year old dude that can jump off whatever you jump out of the back of a deuce and a half and you're fine. If I jumped out of the back of a deuce and a half today, I'd be like, Oh, <laughs> I'd be hurting for a little while and just and jumping <laughs> up. Same thing. Yeah. Um, injuries, Injuries take longer to recover from. Tell us about, uh, kind of go into the, I don't want you to get too in depth because I think there's a lot of information in this book, but give us kind of the, what what are those check blocks that you talk about? Uh, the big thing is, you talked about it already, is, is recognizing that your body's not the same. You know, muscles are still muscles, bones are still bones, but we don't recover as quickly. And we don't really recover as efficiently. So I don't, I don't want to use the word brittle because that sounds old and frail, but we are a little bit more prone to injury. Yeah. So we, that means we have to exercise intelligently. We have to do things maybe we didn't want to do when we were younger. Like we actually have to warm up and stretch, right? We didn't. Yeah, that's a big you know, one. Yeah. It's, it's huge. You know, it's, I, I think about in my thirties, it's walk out of the team room and walk across the street. And as soon as we walked across the street, it was, it was like a joke. You'd, you'd go across the crosswalk and then the first guy to get across the street would turn right and just take off running. And the rest of the team would have to keep up. Right. It was like a joke. Yeah. If I tried to do that now, I, I don't know how many injuries I'd have by the time I got to the end of the block. So you have to work out smart. You have to warm up and you have to recover properly. You have to work not just to be fast and strong, but also to be durable, to be flexible, to be mobile. And the difference in flexibility and mob mobility, which a lot of people don't understand, flexibility is, okay, can I bend over and touch my toes? Yes. No. That's flexibility. Mobility is how high no, can I, I lift my leg? You know, you know, I can't. <laughs> mobility is, is how you do it without the aid of gravity. Right. And you need to work both. It's not just enough. There are plenty of people out there that are flexible, but not mobile. You know, they have really stretchy ligaments and tendons, but then when they try to move through that under their own power, they can't do it. And you really have to have both. Can, can uh, I, I'm going to, can I tell you something my wife says, and yeah. you tell me if you agree with this or not. Motion is the lotion. Yeah. Motion's totally the lotion. And that's, that's one of the reasons that, that I say now, and I, and I talk about it in the book is you shouldn't stretch cold. You should warm up for about five minutes. That gets blood flowing to the muscles and tissues that you're about to stretch. And it also lubricates your joints. All right. Your, your joints sense that movement. Think how stiff you are when you first get up in the morning. Right. But as you move, the joint goes up, oh, we're, we're doing this again. We're, we're going to need a little bit more fluid in here to kind of, to kind of grease the skids so we can move around a little bit better. Well, when I get out of bed in the morning, it looks like, uh, it looks like a, I look like the evolutionary chart. <laughs> Starting hunched over. I mean, yeah, I start, yeah. I, and yeah. seriously, I start and my, my steps aren't right because my feet are hurting or my mm -hmm. knees or whatever. And by the time I make a lap around the house, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm ready to go, but at least, you know, you've got, you've got that movement. I think that's where a lot of us, when we retire, um, lose it. I've been lucky. I've been staying, I stay very busy. So I'm always moving. And I think that's like you said, you know, the do all the warm up and then stretch and then work on that. But mm -hmm. if you don't work on mobility, you lose it. You absolutely lose it. It's it's you, you won't be able to maintain it. And then as you lose mobility, you become way more prone to injury because then you're moving wrong. 
yeah. right? You have, you know, what, uh, what is the orthopedics like to call uh, the kinetic chain? You start moving wrong and then you start hurting in other places because you're, you're favoring an injury or you're favoring a stiff joint, which means the slack gets picked up somewhere else in that chain. And it, it becomes over time, it can become catastrophic. The, what I like about your, your book here is some of these things that you tell us to do They're they seem difficult, but they're not right. So tell us about water. I, I, you know, it's funny. Cause as soon as you said that I was going to say like drinking 16 ounces of water every morning, <laughs> it's dude, that's, that's <laughs> like, I mean, that's not a hard thing to do really. It's not, just not at you all. Do it. Yeah. You just you have just to remember to do, to do it. it. And that was such a game changer for me when I started doing that. And it wasn't, although I've always known how important water was. And of course, as a medic, you know, what are we always telling people to drink water? I was always telling people to drink water, but the concept that I talk about in my book, I got from a guy named Dave Hall, who's a, a an SF guy who owns a gym here in Texas. And Dave told me, he said, the moment I wake up every day before I even get out of bed, I drink eight to 16 ounces of water and I'm never behind the hydration curve. So I started doing the same thing. And what amazed me right away is how good I felt at five o'clock in the afternoon just from doing that because I started out ahead of the hydration curve. And all night long, the liquid that's in your circulation goes back into the tissues. You know, we're taller when we first wake up in the morning because our vertebral discs get all of their uh, hydration back and they swell back up to their normal size. All of our tissues, all of our cells are sucking in that liquid all night long. And plus if at our age, you're getting up to go to the bathroom at night too, right? So you're losing fluid that way. So you're dehydrated. Your blood is very viscous. You're pushing like 90 weight oil when you wake up. So you need to thin that mix right away. And every morning I get up, if I'm, if I'm waking up to an alarm, I reach over, I turn it off. I'm moved to a sitting position, but I don't stand up. I've got a 16 ounce bottle of water still sealed there on the nightstand. I crack it open and I drink the entire bottle of water before I stand up. And that also gives me a few minutes in a sitting position. So I don't, you know, jump out of bed too soon. Maybe get a little bit lightheaded, uh, helps me think about my day, everything I have to do. I, I also have to say that it makes that that early morning trip to to have a bowel movement a lot easier and a lot more pleasant because you get something in your digestive system, your stomach says, "Oh, we're we're back on the clock again." Let your intestines know, kind of gets everything moving. So it really makes everything easier. I the, what the the change I made, and I did this because of your book. I I I tried to drink water, but I wasn't getting it done every morning like that. Mm -hmm. So I stopped setting my coffee maker to turn on. Mm. So Smart. now what I do is I don't stay in bed. I, I get up, I make my way out to the kitchen, turn on the coffee machine. And then I go to the fridge and fill up that big glass of water. And I'm like, I'm going to drink this and I can definitely do it because it takes 10 or 12 minutes to brew up the old black rifle coffee. Mm -hmm. And and by that time I've had it. And I, I mean, I always, always, always feel better when, uh, when I've done that. Um, the next thing I'd like you to talk about is sleep. Probably the most neglected thing. And globally, we have a huge problem with sleep. If you pull most people, they say they're not getting enough sleep. Uh, most people that have lived lives like you and I have are definitely not getting enough sleep. And, you know, part of that is self-inflicted because we tend to be doing the type A thing that we're go, go, go. We want to get stuff done. Uh, it's also a little bit secondary to the crazy schedules we like to work and having previously been on reverse cycle for long periods of time. Uh, some of the bumps and bruises we've got along the way, which might cause some discomfort and prevent us from getting really restful sleep. All of these things play into it. And what I encourage people to do is stop looking at sleep as wasted time, because that's what we've been conditioned to do in our culture is we look at sleep and we say, if only I didn't have to get sleep, 
think of all the things I could accomplish. And I want to, I want to turn that around on its head. I want to look at sleep as bonus time, that that's eight hours of meditation. That's eight hours of learning. That's eight hours of where I'm really building muscle when my tissues are really repairing themselves. So I only spent an hour and a half in the gym that day, but then I got to really put that to work over eight hours of recovery when I really made gains. If I was at a range that day and maybe I learned a new technique to draw from concealment or practicing a specific shooting drill, I walk around the rest of that day with that in my temporary memory, right? So it's, it's kind of hanging out in my RAM. But when I go to sleep at night, all that stuff gets written to the hard drive. So that's when I'm actually learning. Also really important to eliminate the toxins from your system. Uh, during the day in our central nervous system, we build up these things called beta amyloids that are floating around in our, in our central nervous system in the, in the cerebrospinal fluid. We filter that at night. And if we don't filter that, those become beta amyloid plaques, which we know are directly related to things like Alzheimer's disease. So sleep is vitally important. Uh, you can look at it one of two ways. Either we're stuck with it and we just have to do it, or you can look at it as something to embrace and appreciate, which is what I've come to do, and realize that that's where you're making all the important gains in all aspects of your life. So why is it eight hours? Yeah, eight hours is I mean, kind is, of an is arbitrary. Eight hours, is eight hours, like, is, is eight hours the, 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 the max, the minimum? What would you say there? I, I would say eight hours is the average. You know, I, I know people that okay. do fine on six, uh, people that need somewhere between eight and nine. It's kind of rare to need more than nine. I need a block that's greater than eight because I have this thing where I'll wake up typically some at some point between about 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. I'll have a period of wakefulness. And that's just always been the case for me. And when I was on active duty, that was the time period that I would wake up and stress out about the fact that I only had so many hours left to my alarm going off. And it made it really difficult to get back to sleep. Yeah. You keep looking at your alarm saying, two, three, okay, if I go to bed, right, if I sleep right now and get three hours, oh man, two hours. Oh, crap. Math. Doing yeah. the math. You know, and that was somebody, uh, when I was in medical school told me, they said, once you set your alarm, you should never have a clock where you can see it in the night for just that reason because you'll start doing mental math. And if you're having a difficult time falling asleep, you'll be drawn to continue to look at the clock. And if, if I set an alarm on my phone, I turn my phone face down. So I can't, you know, even if my signal app goes off or an update comes through and, and, and you know, I don't want the screen to light up, but I also don't want to look and see what time it is. Um, eight hours is an average. I think it's a, it's a good goal to shoot for. And then people can kind of figure out well, I need a little bit more. I need a little bit less. I do fine on seven. Um, it's just kind of what we've, we've come to accept as the arbitrary average. You know, one of the things, and I've told people this before on the podcast, but one of the things I've started to do that, that seems to help me is when I have that moment where I can't sleep, mm -hmm. it's always because of my brain. Always. It's, it's net. I mean, if I got something that's hurting, that's, that's rare. Normally by that time of the night, I'm, you know, I'm good, whatever. It's my brain that keeps moving. So if I get up and write down whatever that thought is, mm -hmm. I go right back to sleep. That's a great trick. Yeah. Cause you can, that way mentally you let it go. Cause you know, okay, it's logged. So if I need it, I can reference it later. Yeah. And I, and, and I think part of the, the reason it bothers me when I don't do that is because I know that if I go back to sleep, when I wake up, I won't remember it. Right. So I, I want to get, I want to write it down right then and there. One of the other things too, thank goodness coronavirus came around that year was the, that's the best year of my life. And one of the things I started to do during that time is I quit using an alarm. And I mean, I totally, I'm like, I don't have any place to be except for right here. So I'm just going to sleep until I'm I'm happy. So I would go to bed and and sometimes I'll be in bed by eight o'clock at night, but then I read till nine, sometimes till 10. Well, guess what? No alarm set. I'm up at five. I'm up at five 30. I'm up at six. 
it's never eight, not, it's nothing like that. I'm still up when I need to be up. And then when I wake up, you know what I do? I just get out of bed mm -hmm. and start my day. And now thanks to your book, I'm going at least getting my, my glass of water. That makes a huge difference. One of the other things I did want to go back to, and you said warming up. One thing I've been doing is forging. And you'd think picking up a hammer, you kind of warm up as you're going. Man, you got to warm up a little bit with that hammer before you actually start to put some power behind it yeah. because you will, your your shoulders, and I've found this out over the, well, I guess over my whole time in the military, but man, your shoulders are, they're not delicate, but there's so many different muscles there. It's a very complex cool. joint. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm having trouble with one of mine right now, my left one. So I have been going to the physical therapist, which makes a, a huge difference. I thought I was going to have to get cut on and the doc goes... No, nah, we can fix you up pretty fast. And I thought, oh, here we go. He's going to cut on me. He goes, just walk across the, the to the other room over there. There's physical therapist. And, nice. and I thought, yeah, that ain't going to help. This lady, the very first time I went, I got almost 100% relief from the very first visit. So I've, I've been going back and trying to, I mean, eventually I'll probably get surgery, but I, I want to I want to not just jump into that. So, you know, the so sleep. Um, can you, can, and you, and you talk about this in your book, I'm pretty sure you do talk about some supplements. Mm -hmm. Can you, t can you tell us kind of what you would recommend or what maybe even what you wouldn't recommend? Uh, and I'm talking about for sleep, for yeah, sleep, for sleep. The probably the most important thing is avoiding caffeine after I say two in the afternoon. Some people can probably tolerate it a little bit later than that. Uh, that's important to avoid. Things to avoid as crutches for sleeping. If you look at the uh, the over the counter like Zequil and things like that, they're all basically Benadryl. Benadryl, you feel like you're helping yourself because you take it and you feel drowsy, and you're like, okay, I'm going to get some sleep it actually prevents you from getting the real deep sleep and restful sleep that you need on a, on a mental level. So I tell people to avoid Benadryl, you know, as if it works for you and you need it as like a one-time thing, that's fine. But by and large, I don't think Benadryl is a, is a good sleep aid, not a good idea to get dependent on prescription sleep aids, which, and I talk about this in the book, there, there was a time when I absolutely needed them after doing prolonged, you know, 90 day periods on reverse cycle. Uh, I just couldn't absolutely couldn't fall asleep without them. And I've, I've had a, a lifetime of sleep disturbances. And then, and then I've worked the absolute worst possible jobs for people that have trouble sleeping, right? Because in the soft community, we're always working at night. And in emergency medicine, we're doing shift work. So we're cycling back and forth between night, evening, day shift. So I, I never should have probably had any of those jobs simply because of how much difficulty I have sleeping to begin with, but yeah. a little too late for that. Um, so those are things I would say to avoid is, you know, don't, if you need a prescription sleep aid, don't make it a long-term thing. Don't take Benadryl because it's not going to let you get really deep sleep that you need and cut out caffeine, cut out caffeine and spicy fatty foods uh, in, at least in the evening. And then as far as what you should take, Magnesium is amazing. Valerian root is amazing. So t tell it just real quick. What does that do? What does magnesium do for you? So magnesium do does a few things. It's uh, and and I use it in in practice. I use it to treat migraine headaches. It it relaxes all of the little tiny smooth muscles that we don't really have control over. So the the terminal muscles at the end of our uh, airways and our lungs. It opens those up. We give it. That's the reason that we give IV magnesium to asthmatics to open up their lungs. Wow. Okay. All the little tiny vessels, the capillary beds, including the capillary beds, beds up in your brain, the magnesium opens those up. Uh, really good for alleviating headache. It's a it's a muscle relaxer. So if you, you take too much magnesium, it'll actually depress your reflexes and it can depress your respiratory drive as well. So you don't want to take too much. Um, but taken in therapeutic amounts, puts you in a very relaxed state, opens up your terminal airways, you get increased blood flow everywhere, really moves you into a relaxed state. Uh, and as long as you have functioning kidneys, it's actually really difficult to get too much because as soon as your levels start to go too high, typically you'll just pee it all off. Yeah. 
What's the what's the next one? You hear about melatonin? Melatonin. So melatonin is is something that that we make, but we make less of it as we get older. And then in 2021, we're all making less of it because because of screen time. So the screen time is really inhibiting our melatonin production. So it's natural. It's you can get it just about anywhere. Melatonin is is great to help with sleep. So that the the sleep or centers of your brain that are going to put you kind of in that right plane are, are dependent on the melatonin to tell them, you know, that's, that's the off switch. That's the signal to tell you, okay, it's time for us to sleep now. There's some others you mentioned in your book. Um, I know I talk about valerian root. Yeah, that was the one. Yeah. So yeah. is that like a witch doctor thing from your days in seventh group? Did you learn that from like a, a tribal? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing, nothing so fancy. I just, people were talking about it all the time. And I think I want to say the first time I was introduced to valerian root, I could be wrong. Might've been when I was in halo school that when you go into night week, uh, I remember my roommate and I went, we got, we got like an herbal tea. Uh, cause we said, all right, we're going to be disciplined about this and we're going to go to bed at like four or five o'clock in the afternoon, whatever we needed to, because night, night week in Halo school is really early, early morning week. You know, you're not, you're not going in at like eight o'clock yep. at night. Um, and I think we got an herbal tea that had valerian root in it. So it was just something that I always remembered. And it's, you, you'll see in a lot of the over the counter sleep aids that you see out there, Alteril is one that I've taken in the past that has valerian root in it. What is like Advil PM? I've taken that some, what, what is, is that? Um... All Advil PM is, is Advil with Benadryl. Okay. Yeah. And like I say, it works for some people, but I don't think it's good. Yeah. Don't, and don't, like you said, I mean, anything I think in minimal amounts can be fine, but well, maybe not anything, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, and I, think... ta I talk about that as, specifically in the nutrition chapter, but it really does apply to everything. Moderation. You know, if I, I don't drink a bottle of whiskey every day, but I'll sit out on my back porch with a whiskey and a cigar a couple times a month. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It makes life worth living. So hit on the, hit on the, the, uh, your, your eating habits. Can you just kind of give us a, a quick brush through that as well? One thing I didn't like, you yeah. said the caveman diet's not going to work. Well, no, I didn't say the caveman diet's not going to work. You I said, well, okay, what you said was you need to make sure you put some vegetables in there too. And I'm yeah. good with that. So, yeah. 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 So it, I talk about the exclusionary diets and avoiding those. And I, yeah. I mentioned paleo and I say, you know, it's probably the most acceptable of the exclusionary because it really doesn't exclude very much. It excludes uh, industrial farming type stuff, but it also prohibits tree nuts and cheeses, which I think, I mean, most Americans eat too much cheese, but I think as a, as a, as a ready go-to for a source of protein. I think cheese is pretty palatable. Most people can tolerate it if they're not lactose intolerant. And I think if you eliminate tree nut, nuts, you're eliminating protein. And they're also good sources of plant fats. You know, oil, you know oil, good oily nuts like cashews are really good for you. Avoiding exclusionary diets, I think, is pretty important. They've become pretty faddish. Uh, Veganism has become more and more popular, which I consider more to be a philosophy than I do a diet. That's all. We could have a whole series of podcasts just talking about that and debating that back and forth. The carnivore hey, diet. Just, look, look, just you, you said something that's very interesting to me right here. Okay. Just explain that to me. Just I understand what you're saying, but tell me why why that would be bad for the human body or why it would be good for the body. Yeah. So. The basis, uh, you know, the argument that you hear uh, from vegans all the time is that, you know, we need a more plant-based diet. Now, if you're talking, if, if by that you mean, okay, the amount of, of plants that are in the normal Western diet is not enough and everyone needs more, nobody can argue that. That's 100% true because most of what we're eating is processed food. We're not getting enough vegetables. Uh, we're getting way too much complex stuff, refined carbohydrates, refined sugars. Uh, we're getting way too many fatty meats. People probably by and large eat more red meat than they should. Although, the, you know, there's 
a lot of disparity in the debate over how much is too much. Um, so when vegans say that, they're at, they are absolutely right. Now, if you're referring to a plant-based diet as one where if you do the pie chart, most of your calories are coming from plants, then yeah, that's a healthy diet. That's a good diet. But when you go on to say that well, we're just going to exclude all animal products, that's where you start to get into trouble. Because if you cut out all meats, you cut out eggs, you cut out dairy, now you're having difficulty getting enough protein. You're having difficulty getting enough B vitamins, uh, a lot of other micronutrients you're going to have some issues with. So that's why I say veganism is a little bit more of a philosophy because most people arrive at veganism from a philosophy of, I don't, I don't think that animals are here to serve us. And for that reason, I'm not going to eat animals. I'm not going to eat anything that comes from animals. I'm only going to eat things that come from plants. But a lot of the data that they'll show you, and I, I had this conversation with someone online just last week, and I knew this was going to happen. So we get into a debate and they start sending me links. And I've seen all these links so many times. And what I've also found out in these debates is that they haven't seen the link. They know where the links are, but they've never really read them. Because the first link that he sent me was a review done by a PhD who happens to be a vegan who wanted to find proof of plant-based diets being good and did a review of all these old studies and put them all together. But the commonality throughout these studies is very, very few of them were 100% plant diets. They were more plants than Western diets, but not 100% plant diets. Um, I think most of the data out there on any exclusionary diet, you're going to have confounders. You know, even the carnivore diet has become popular, but a lot of the data says that the benefit from the carnivore diet, the people that have, you know, weight loss and everything else, they're getting fewer calories, you know, and also of course there's uh, carnivore diet tends to work a lot the same way that the Adkins diet works that because you're not getting a lot of carbohydrates, you have to burn fat for fuel. So for that reason, you're going to lose weight. But all the exclusionary diets, to some extent, in my opinion, have downfalls in that you're either going to have to supplement micronutrients, you're going to have to be way more mindful of, of how you get your protein, or in the case of the carnivore diet, there's been some studies to show links to vitamin deficiency and even some cancers from eating too much meat. So do you think eyelashes have anything to do with it? Eyelashes? Yeah, eyelashes. So I believe this is this is my hypothesis. Mm -hmm. You can write about this if you want. Okay. And I'm gonna I'm gonna chew you out real quick. Your blog is awesome, and then you stopped writing on it like two years ago. And <laughs> bro, you, you 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 leave us hanging. So we're gonna. I know. Back to I, I do need to get back to that. So you you do, yeah, yeah. You need to get back. I'm gonna. To that. I'm probably gonna migrate that from Dr. Mike Simpson over to the Graybeard site and and start doing it again. Okay. So. Um, I, I, my feeling is if an animal has eyelashes, mm -hmm. it's safe from vegans. Hmm. If it doesn't have eyelashes like fish, mm -hmm. they don't mind chowing down on some fish every now and again. Well, I've had, I've had a lot of vegans tell me that they don't eat fish either. And, and it's, what's funny is I had, a, well, they haven't realized that fish don't have eyelashes. Yeah. They just once they, they feel, once they realize that they'll be like, yeah, I don't care about fish. They got no eyelashes. I'll eat them. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I had a vegan tell me that the proof was, I said, there's been no large scale studies. And he said, oh, the proof is in the Okinawan diet. And I said, they're pescatarians. They're not vegans. Yeah. Yeah. For you people that don't know, pescatarian, that means they uh, like to go fishing. Yeah. And there's nothing <laughs> wrong. Pescatarian diet is, is very healthy as long as you know, people talk about mercury and stuff like that. And that is a concern. But depending on what your fish choices are. You, it can be a very healthy diet. Man, I had a great question for you and I totally, I should have wrote it down because now I can't remember it, but I'm going to, we're going to. No, keep no worry. You know what? I, I can really quick, I can kind of give the one over, you know, I talked about what not to do. So I can yeah. give like the one over the world on what, what I do and what I think people should do. Um, first and foremost, avoid processed foods. If you, if it comes in a can, in a box, uh, Mm, sometimes from the freezer section or somebody handed it through you to you through your car window, 
it's probably bad for you. So the, the closer you are to the source, right? You, you get something that you know the person that killed it or you know the person that grew it and pulled it out of the ground, that's way better for you than stuff that comes with, uh, with a weird picture and a logo on it that you got on a shelf somewhere. Uh, so that's number one, avoiding processed food. Number two is everything in moderation. So if you have one particular thing that you really like, you know, you, you like Dr. Pepper, don't drink six Dr. Peppers a day. Drink maybe one small Dr. Pepper a day or maybe make Dr. Pepper a, a, on the weekend thing. But moderation is key. Uh, this also goes with, with processed foods is, you know, things that are high in sugar. And uh, think of when we're talking about the paleo diet, the caveman diet, I, I don't think cavemen had the ability to make pasta. So that's probably something that's not really good for you. And don't, don't get me wrong. I love pasta. I love ravioli. I love tortellini. I love angel hair pasta. Uh, it's a lot of carbohydrates though. And that's where most Americans get into trouble is in their carbohydrates. So when I'm looking at my macros, my protein, my carbohydrates, and my fats, I prioritize my proteins. And if I'm prior, I found that if I prioritize my proteins, and making healthy decisions when it comes to my carbs and to my fats, I don't have to count numbers. I don't have to count grams. I don't have to count calories. Everything usually typically falls into place. And I go a little bit more in depth in the nutrition chapter. I talk about some specific goals that you can start with as a baseline for how much protein you're getting, uh, for how much uh, carbohydrates and, and how much fat you're getting. But those are just guidelines and starting points. One thing I've really noticed, I've tried to do this on the range more. If I eat on the range during lunch, if I go eat a big meal, I am just, or even if like it's a sandwich, I'm just like trying, man, I can't hardly get my mind back in the game. If I just eat some meat and I like cheese, so I'll eat some meat and I'll eat some cheese and maybe some almonds or whatever, drink some water. Maybe I might have a Gatorade or something at lunch. I feel so much better if I just don't overdo it um, at lunchtime. And I do want to, I want you to hit on one other thing too, that I hear a lot about lately. Mm -hmm. Fasting. What do you, what, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I know that there's good data out there and people have had excellent results with it. Um, it's not something that would fit into my lifestyle. So I, my wife and I tried it briefly. I didn't see a big change. Um, I had Mike Dolce on my podcast uh, quite some time back and he talked about that. And, and basically his take on it is, well, we all fast anyway, because you, you know, you're not getting up at one o'clock in the morning and, and having something to eat. Who, who is he? Mike Dolce is a, uh, he's a nutritionist. He's worked with a lot of UFC fighters. He's written a few okay. books on it. Uh, he wrote a book called the Dolce diet. Uh, and he, like me, he's, he's like, stay away from the exclusionary stuff, you know, eat wholesome, good foods, you know, from good sources and, and eat in moderation and just don't go crazy and, and you should be fine. Um, he's not an advocate of fasting. I think just for most people, it's kind of, th then you're, uh, then you're a slave to the clock. And, and I just, I don't want to live that way. You know, I, I don't want to be, okay, I get up and then I have X amount of time before I can eat anything. Cause then that's going to affect when I can work out and, when I can have my coffee because I like to eat before I have my coffee and, and all these other things. So people do it and it works for them. And that's great if it works for them. I don't advocate it because again, I think it, it would involve a, for most people a, a pretty big lifestyle change. I tell people eat when you're hungry, uh, you know, never be hungry, never be full. You know, it's like, I feel a little bit hungry. Like you said, get, get some meat, cheese, you know, some, some turkey slices and some cheese cubes eat those, but don't eat a meal throughout the day at any point that you feel just, oh, wow, I need a nap. I ate so much. I got to lay down or I got to unbutton my top button on my pants. You know, that's, that's being full, you know, know the difference between sanity, like I've had enough to eat and fullness, which is that Thanksgiving meal. You know, you know, you're talking to a soldier when he says you have to unbutton the top button of your pants. Right, because who does that anymore? Yeah, because most people <laughs> have zippers, right. but the military still has buttons. Right. <laughs> hey, um, 
So MMA, you you uh, you do some grappling. Yeah. And how many of those top MMA guys are vegetarians? Not very many. There are some. Yeah, there there are some, uh, and they do well. Mark Hunt is one that comes to mind, and he's a, he's even a heavyweight. Uh, and there's a few more, and there's some high level Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guys that that don't eat meat. Again, it, it works for some people, but let, let's, so let's talk about their lifestyle compared to the average person who's going to read my, my book, right? Their lifestyle is such that they are 100% dedicated to, you know, from, from the moment they get up in the morning to the, when they go to bed at night into everything they're doing to train and everything that they're doing to put into their body which means they have a support chain that goes along with that when it comes to meal prep, when it comes to seeking out their sources of food, you know, they're, they're not having to go on a business trip or, you know, all their meetings got moved around or picking up the kids, uh, you know, from point A and going to point B. I mean, I'm sure like a lot of more family men, so they are doing that, but their job is to monitor what they put in their body and to work out. So if you have that type of time to dedicate to it, then an exclusionary diet can work for you because it's not as much of an issue that, well, because I'm getting soy protein instead of whey protein, I have to eat way more of it and I have to eat it in this time window before I work out as opposed to after I work out. Or I, I need to make sure I'm getting all my B vitamins through these yeah. sources. They can do all those things because literally that's the focus of their life. But somebody who's working a nine to five job or shift work or in the military, I, I don't think that's practical. One of the things I, and I, I noticed this with my dog. So my dog got a little overweight cause she was on the all you could eat plan. So he said, we're going to stop that. And we're going to give her and the other dog feed him out of a can. We didn't want to do it because we didn't want the little dog to suffer because the big dog was, you know, a chow hound. Mm -hmm. Well, the little dog gained weight because she's got bad teeth. So she's eating soft food now. So she actually got healthier and the big dog became super focused. Like, like she was when she was younger mm -hmm. and she's only trigger. You're what are you seven? She's sitting over here looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I think she's, I think she just turned eight and that's, uh, to me, that's, I, I noticed that and I tried a little bit of that with myself, mm -hmm. man, if you are full of food, you can't think if you have enough food in you, I mean, not overdoing it, you are much, a much sharper person. And that once again, Absolutely. thank goodness for coronavirus. It was awesome. It few people had to die because of it. That sucks. But the good thing that came out of it, I get to be at home with my wife who cooks mostly fresh food. So in the morning we have eggs from our chickens. Mm -hmm. And I mean, some people would say eggs are bad. I eat eggs every day, much like my dad did, <laughs> you know, um, I do practically yeah, every day, day. at least six days a week. I would, I eat eggs, but when she cooks, she, like you said, she doesn't take it out of a box or out of a can. She's cooking it. She's usually using fresh food there. And I just don't think that you can go wrong with that. But looking at, at how triggered my dog gets motivated when she has the right amount of chow, that's, that really spoke volumes to me. Right. And um, we had talked about Alex Racy a little bit ago before the podcast, a uh, former unit guy, buddy of mine. And he has talked a little bit about some fasting stuff and then the focus that you feel. And I think that, you know, maybe – Maybe for me, it's not the, the word fasting shouldn't be in there because I don't fast, mm -hmm. but I, I have tried to not eat as much because one, I'm, I'm not as active as I used to be, so I can't eat what I used to eat. And man, I feel, I just feel more focused if I'm not plum full of chow, you know? Yeah. Um, anything else on your book? Oh, there's, there's one other thing I did want to hit with your book. When when you see this book, folks, you're going to think this guy is going to tell you to do, you know, you're going to have to start drinking tofu drinks and do all this <laughs> kind of stuff. Um, it's it's not like that at all. This book is as, and you can you can interrupt if I say this wrong, but this book is for warriors. 
Absolutely. That's what I wrote it for. Yeah, 100%. If you think you're a warrior or know that you're a warrior and you're over 40, and I would say even if you're not over 40, there's some really good stuff in this book. There's one chapter in this book, and, and I'm just going to tell you it's my favorite chapter, your tribe. Tell me about that. If I, I mean, if, if I had to sum it up, you are who you surround yourself with. We, we've all heard that before. It sounds kind of cliche, but it's true. And the importance of a tribe is a tribe motivates the individual to be the best possible version of themselves that they can be. Because you never want to be the weakest link in the tribe. We're all going to need help from time to time. There's, there's always going to be a time on a particular day doing a particular thing that might be more difficult for you that we are the one that needs somebody to reach over and, and grab us by the scruff of our shirt and, and kind of pick us up. We're all going to be in that position at one time. Yep. Uh, none of us want to be in that position all the time, right? So anytime you're on a team, this is something that we learned from the military. You know, so-and-so was always the best shooter. So-and-so was always the fastest. So-and-so was the strongest. You know, if, if we needed a door kicked in, it was Sean. If we needed somebody, it, hey, we need somebody to run fast, smooth, get over there. You know, it, there's always somebody who's going to be the best at something. And we, we all love that about each other and about ourselves. And being part of a tribe means we've always got, you always got a rabbit to chase whether it's in how much weight we lift, in how well we shoot, uh, in how well we grapple, in how well we spar with the gloves on, in anything. So your tribe is, is always pushing you. And, and I tell people, I, I said this at a sheepdog event a, a few years ago, and, and it got a lot of laughs, but it also made a lot of people think. I said, if you are the toughest one of your friends, find new friends. Yeah, that's awesome. Because you, you want to be challenged. You know, and it's it, like if I only hung around, you know, not not to diminish my colleagues in medicine, but if if I only hung around with doctors, I'd be like, well, I can I can kick everybody's ass, you know, about at least ninety nine percent of them. Uh, so I don't. You need know, to AJ. You know, AJ. AJ. AJ, big black dude was on J Mao. Isn't it AJ? AJ. I thought that was his name, AJ. I call I because I was gonna say that'd be a pretty good fight right there. That Joker yeah. was a big cat. I got, he might have been I got before my time. somebody the other day, and they mentioned I, I want to say his name was AJ, but I can't um I'm gonna look it up real quick on my phone because I might have it. I might be completely off here too. He he might have been pre-Mike Simpson, so I might not ever met him. Yeah, I don't have it. Yeah. I don't have it on here. But anyway, yeah, I, I, I really like what you're saying there. That that's the the other thing I would like to add about tribe is we don't all have to get along. Now, I'm not talking about the tribe. I'm talking about like in society. Mm -hmm. There's people in society I never, ever want to talk to because there's no reason to talk to them. Right. I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm just saying that that there's there's no reason for them to talk to me and there's no reason for me to talk to them. That doesn't mean I won't be kind to them if I run into them on the street or they got a flat tire. I need to help them. I'll gladly do that. Mm -hmm. But, man, get past this whole thing where we all got to be kumbaya and sitting around holding hands because guess what? That's it ain't going to work out because I'm not going to fit into your into your group there. Saying that, I'm not saying you got to be an army guy or a guy that carries a gun for a living or a cop or anything like that. I find that I go to some places where people in my tribe go and I find other people that are in my tribe that I didn't know. Like there's a doctor I show up and I'm at a hunting camp somewhere. Guess what? We're in the same tribe. Yeah. I mean, he's going to go out and grapple with you or he's going to go, you know, shoot a bunch of pistol. No, but he likes to hunt. He likes to fish. And that guy is going to be, or that gal is going to be part of my tribe. So I think I hear a lot about the um, tribes and, and I think some people get it all backwards. I think that, you know, you look at the Indians, they were strong tribes and they did not, they did not mix. 
period. That's the way it was. Now, I'm not saying that as a race. I'm saying that as a warrior culture. Yeah, um, and also there, kind of to illustrate the, the point you just made, but if, say, uh, the Indians – did a did a raid on either uh, another Indian tribe or on some European settlers, and they adopted those children into the tribe. They became a part of the tribe. Yep, it doesn't exactly. matter that you know you're you're genetically disparate from the rest of us. You're a part of the tribe because we said you're a part of the tribe, and as long as you continue to espouse our values and what we do, then you're a part of the tribe. Um. I, I mentioned this earlier. You've got a blog, and uh, once again, you got to do better at that because it's it's awesome reading. <laughs> it's it's super good reading, and it really um, it inspired me to think through some of the just life. I guess the 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 first thing that pops up when you when you do you know what the first thing is that pops up when you go to your blog is uh is it is it the the uh, the sheep says wheel no well I'm, i don't know about that but the first the first article is called red hat guy oh yeah 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 and what's really funny about that is it, when you read red hat guy i was like trump i mean what's the deal and then yeah that's what everybody the article thought. has nothing to do about politics mm -hmm. it has everything to do about the red hat guy so people should definitely go and check this out. Some of the comments that that or some of the things that you've written about here that I want to talk about are politicians as leaders not nope. <laughs> so why do you why do you say that? Uh you know politicians are elected officials. We basically elect them to do a job that nobody else really wants to do, and rightly so, yeah. right? So we want them to manage the, the, we want them to do backside support. We want them to manage the day-to-day -day operations, you know, keep the roads paved, keep the street lights turned on, and do all the stuff that we don't want to do so we can be productive members of society, right? The, the politicians are kind of the epitome of, of the support chain. They're in the, you have your, your tooth and your tail, and they're definitely tail. And they're not our leaders. They work for us. We pay their salary. We let we decide whether they're even doing that job or not. We hire. We can hire and fire them. Right? You can't hire and fire your own leaders. You don't. You don't pay somebody to lead you. So they're not our leaders. And it's 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 always bothered me that people refer our leaders in Washington. We don't have any leaders in Washington. We have elected representatives in Washington. And the moment that we feel they don't represent us anymore, that we vote them out. But I I can't think. Other than a few notable exceptions, Mike Waltz and Dan Crenshaw, I wouldn't follow anyone in D.C. to get a sandwich. <laughs> you Man, you hit that. I'm not going to say anything more. You hit that. <laughs> That's the hammer on the head of the nail right there. Um, one other thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in here real quick. And Yeah, you reminded me of these, and I wrote these so long ago. This, the, all these blogs were, were pre-booked too. So. Yeah, so so I want to talk with you about gun control. And, and I, I guess really where I want to focus on this, some of your data is from 2017. Yeah, that's a little old. No, no, that's fine. I, I mean, I'm, but I'm just going to say it's probably increased mm -hmm. uh, since then. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to blurt this out, then you, you can – talk after that, I guess. So speaking of statistics, how does that 15,611 number stack up against other preventable causes of death? And what you were saying was 15,611 murders where guns were used mm -hmm. in 2017. Motor vehicle accidents for 2017 were 37,133. 10,874 uh, involved drunk drivers. Drug overdoses, listen to this folks, 70,200. And I would, I would go out on a limb and say that's probably went up astronomically Certainly in the last few years. Go, go ahead. Uh, it, it, drug, drug overdoses during COVID, we know, increased exponentially. The next one is uh, 
non-smokers killed annually by secondhand smoke, 41,280. Smokers killed by smoking annually, 439,000. Killed by complications of alcoholism annually, 88,000. Killed by complications of obesity annually, 300,000. And killed by medical errors, 250,000. So a pretty good, uh, pretty good start there. And then your part two of this, this, this is shocking. And I've heard these numbers before, but to see them written down really hit me below the... <laughs> Well, not below the belt. It hit me right in the gut. So once again, 2017 firearm murders were 15,611. Um, and I really wonder that a murder and somebody who needs to be shot, are those getting put into the same category? You know what I'm saying? Well, and I think I talked about that in there, that that's the number of people where one person deliberately shot another person and ended their life. Uh, not all 15,000, I, I guarantee that those 15,000 were not handing out soup and Bibles. Yeah. Downtown yeah. Somewhere. yeah. It's because if you, if you compute in gang on gang violence and everything else, that's the majority of those cases is, you know, one drug dealer shot another or, uh, you know, two, two guys who've been running together already who had kind of a weird past, uh, had a dispute and one shot the other. So after you, and this is in the second one, you said um, fire murders in 2017, 15, 6, 11, compared to Nazi persecution, total deaths, 17 million. Soviet rule under Stalin, 20 million. Communist China, 35 million, 326,000. Cambodia under Pol Pot, 1.871 million Armenian genocide 1.5 million and then you make a statement and this is awesome the list goes on and on those numbers represent the potential price of not I say again of not having the right to own weapons that put the citizenry on a level playing field with those who would seek to persecute them that's that's a very powerful powerful statement there yeah so, that's the point that I think a lot of people would rather forget, you know, we hear, Oh, you want people to have guns. So you're okay with dead kids. No, I'm not okay with dead kids, but let, let's put it in perspective. You know, you're, you're we're talking about 15,000 a year. Let's even call it 16,000 a year. We'll round it up compared to all of those numbers. It's, you know, when people say the cost, the cost of having all these guns out here, is 16,000 murders a year. Well, the cost of us not having them is potentially as high as you know, 17 million dead because we don't have the ability to stand up and fight against an oppressor. Well, one of the answers you need to change there is when they say, "Aren't what about you know these kids getting killed? It's like, you're right. We should ban abortion. <laughs> right. You know right. what I mean? It's like the same yeah. person that wants to take away guns is the same person that believes that killing unborn babies is fine. So there's something... They got a retread. They're driving on retreads or something because they, they don't get it. Yeah. I, people are really selective. And, and the thing about all statistics is it's lying with numbers. And that's why the, the first blog, I really dive into the statistics because the, the you know, between 30 and 40,000 is the number that gets thrown out of there. It, it gets thrown out all the time. And we know that the lion's share of those are suicides. And ironically yeah. enough is a lot of the people who are in favor of euthanasia laws, of, of allowing euthanasia, allowing people to, in a dignified manner, take their own life, they're in favor of that. But the instrument that is most commonly used successfully, which is the gun, they want to ban. Yeah. So continuing with, see, I like that this is all written down. Because then I can hold you accountable for it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's out there forever. <laughs> the bucket list. I am, I, I'll be honest with you, dude. I've never heard anybody say this, what you talked about, the bucket list. That's exactly the way I felt and feel. And I never say I have anything on the bucket list because I don't have a bucket list. But tell me what you think about the bucket list. So I said, I think the title of that blog was, uh, if you have a bucket list, you're failing at life. Yep. 
because you're you're making this imaginary list of things that you're probably never going to do instead of just doing them. And and I understand sometimes there there's a dollar amount attached to things on people's bucket list. I understand that. But if you look at your bucket list and a lot of it is not dollar amount stuff, well, what's keeping you from doing it? You know, you're yeah. only getting older. You know, you could die tomorrow. You could walk out that door, get struck by a bolt of lightning or something else, get run over by a truck tomorrow. So why are you have this list of things you think it would be pretty cool to do? Why aren't you just doing them? And I've never understood that. And I think what, where I first find it, started finding a bucket list mildly offensive <laughs> was that I, I noticed this propensity on, on social media that somebody would post a picture of, you know, they went skydiving or they did this. And somebody would comment, oh, yeah, that's totally on my bucket list. Like, oh, yeah, so we're the same now because, because I went and did it. And you wrote it on a list somewhere saying it would be pretty cool. You know, it, why aren't you doing it? You know, if, if, why are you spending time looking at other people on social media doing it and not just going and doing it? So yeah, if you want to go skydive, it takes exactly one trip to yeah. Rayford drop zone and yeah. you'll have that yeah, you can off do it. your so-called bucket list. You could decide literally right now in the morning and be doing it this afternoon. It's, yeah. There's not a lot of hoops to jump through for that. My wife said something to me one day that that has really, I mean, she says a lot that 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 gets to me and and makes me think. But we were talking about somebody who had cancer, and I told my wife, I said, "What would, man, what would you do if you found out today you had six months to live?" My wife and I had this conversation yesterday. And my wife said, I'm doing it right now. And that's exactly what we said. When she told me that, I wasn't doing it right now. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It made me completely recheck my priorities. Because if you're not doing, if, if, if you're not prepared to die tomorrow, you better change it today. Because tomorrow is coming yeah. Rickety tick. And we don't control it. So get on, get on that. I would say that's, it's, it's a mindset, you know, and maybe some of that is because of our age too. Maybe at, the, at a certain point you get to an age where you say, and I think maybe when you're young, you're like, yeah, I'm not going to, nothing could kill me. And now you're like, man, everything could kill me. So <laughs> you know, I better, I better kind of watch where I'm going here. But I think I've accepted the fact that and you're going to die. So do the right things now and yeah. enjoy life because you could be that guy or gal that finds out that who knows you could get in your car tomorrow and get hit. I mean, that'd be tragic too, but man, it, that her saying that totally changed the way that, that I kind of looked at that. And like you said, the bucket list, man, get out there people and, and don't have a bucket list. Just do what you need to do. And there's things I want to do, but I don't call it bucket list. I, if it was a bucket list, yeah. like you, said, I would just go out and do it. Yeah. Yeah, that's you know you just say, you know you you plan, you know, but things things that are imperatives, you got to just do them, and uh, probably in my second book, which I actually started writing before the first book, uh, I have a whole chapter that I call uh, "Living Your Plan B." That most people are you're actually living you're living your plan B. You're not living your plan A. You know your your plan A was you wanted to be a saddle bronc rider. But you're living your bull, plan bull B, rider, bull yeah. rider. or bull rider. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that that was your plan A. I want to be a bull rider. But your plan B was I, I'm I'm going to work at the bank, and you're working at the bank. Well, now that you've got your plan B down, why not start looking at your plan A again? And maybe you can't go, you know, you can't go full throttle on that. Maybe it is something that that time has slipped away from you. But you can do something to get you close to that. Like, I know I'll never be an MMA fighter. Never going to happen. But I can be a fight physician and I can work with those guys and I can train with those guys. Yeah. So I can get as close to that as humanly possible without actually getting in the cage and developing TBI, CTE, right? I can do all the other things and, and, and be a part of that culture and, 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 and feel it, you know, touch the magic, 
as, as people we used to say, especially when it, when it comes to your old unit, right? Everybody wants to touch the magic. You can still at least touch the magic, you know, even if you can't go whole hog on that. Yeah, the problem is they once they realize there is no magic to touch, it's just a bunch of dudes that were sweating and working hard. Out, <laughs> doing their thing. I will tell you this. I think we could put together something to make you an MMA fighter. I think we could like people would pay to get in the ring and beat on you. You feel like just like 20 bucks a minute or something. Yeah, I, well, maybe more than that. We can sell tickets for that. Yeah, like 50 bucks a minute because you're a doctor. You deserve more money than that. So, I mean, there's a lot of dudes, probably dudes that, that you knew that you grew up with that would just love to get in there. And you might get the better of the first few, mm -hmm. but you're going to wear I would get a number like down in the 15s or 20s. <laughs> so by the time you get in there, you're kind of worn out. And you can get with it. Okay, I, now this one here, um, this I found very interesting. Are anti-vaxxers terrorists yeah i took a lot of heat for that one well it's 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 kind of funny I, I don't think you should take heat for it why would i give you heat for it it's your if this is your blog it's not my blog and to be honest with you i agree with a lot of the stuff you say there but i want people to understand that blog was written before coronavirus was yeah, it it had nothing at all to do with the COVID vaccine or anything like that. So, so tell me what you think. I want people to go read it because it's a great article. It's a very, very good article. Um, one of the things you said was um, vaccines are okay. This is a quote. Some people say vaccines are rushed into public use without testing. And we just don't know enough about what harm they might do. Mm -hmm. You said false vaccines undergo rigorous trials before they are used on a large scale. Have, have there been problems over the last 70 years? Certainly. But anyway, people ought to read that. Now, do you believe I'm reading a book right now called the, the code breakers, mm -hmm. you know, a book I'm talking about. That sounds really familiar. It's, it's about the, the group of scientists and, and it's, it's kind of one lady in particular, it kind of revolves around this American scientist, but it's all the scientists that she came in contact with throughout her career mm -hmm. that worked on DNA Okay. And then RNA, then they worked on CRISPRs, then they're working. On, I mean, now these are people that some of them make yogurt for a living. I, I mean, really, because yeah. what's yogurt? It's a culture. Yeah. What do they have to have? They got to have bacteria mm -hmm. until the viruses. And I mean, there's, it's, it's a really, really, it's a hard book to read because these people are super, super smart, but she's been doing that ever since she, she, I mean, when she was a kid, she read about, DNA, the, the double helix. And she went, okay, I got it. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. And then she, she's been a scientist since I guess like the, or, or the mid eighties, 85, 86, something like that. I found it interesting because this stuff is, is directly related to the coronavirus vaccines. Mm -hmm. and it's something they were working on way, 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 way back when. So what now that now that the coronavirus vaccine is out there, what do you think? So I got it. I got the Moderna vaccine. I got I got the series. <clears throat> so did my wife. So both my sons. Um, and it's because it, I hadn't gone back and read that blog in a long time. But it's it's funny because because one of the big arguments, two things that I keep saying, and, and they both kind of drive me a little bit nuts, is people will say this is an this is an experimental vaccine technically it's not because it did pass phase three trials okay so phase three is kind of the last phase of experimentation before you go into wider use so it's not experimental they feel justified in calling it experimental because it does not have full fda authorization it has a it has an fda emergency use authorization right FDA clearance take, can take as long as 12 years, even 15 in some cases. So it's not something that happens overnight. And the FDA, and rightly so, was not prepared to go, okay, we're going to go full authorization right out of the gate. Because now, a year from now, we find out that there is something that, that wasn't previously anticipated. And I understand why people are cautious. Totally understand why people are cautious. You know, I looked at the science and I looked at was the juice worth the squeeze it, with my age, with working in healthcare and, and having to interact with people that are potentially infectious. 
is it a better idea for me to, to get it as opposed to roll the dice and, and maybe catch it. And I, I'm a hundred percent sure I made the right decision. Uh, the other thing I keep seeing is. So you haven't, you haven't had COVID at all. I have not had COVID. I, you know, I, in fact, I have, I had a very close exposure to COVID. I've had multiple exposures, uh, and tested negative. I had a very close exposure two weeks ago, two guys that I train with, both of which went to, went to training one day, sparred with both of them. So close proximity, sweat, breathing on each other, you know, for six straight minutes on and off over the course of about an hour and a half, two different individuals. One became symptomatic the next day, went and got tested, got COVID. The other symptomatic the following day, got tested, had COVID. I've been completely asymptomatic. I didn't go get tested, but I've, I'm, I'm talking zero symptoms. My, you know, taste, smell, no sneeze, no runny nose, nothing. So I didn't, I didn't even bother to get tested. Uh, two of us in the class are a little bit older, both of us vaccinated. Neither one of us have any symptoms. Uh, now that's, we say that anecdotal evidence is not evidence. So, you know, is my case indicative of everybody? No. Can you get a breakthrough infection? In some cases, yes. One of the individuals that came up positive, very healthy, very athletic individual. Uh, I've got at least 10 years on him, maybe more. He ended up being hospitalized for four days wow. with, with an oxygen requirement and said it's the you know worst thing he's ever felt. Doesn't know how long his recovery is going to be to get back up to, to peak athletic performance again. Um, and he, he said to a bunch of people that he posted on social media, he said, get the shot. He said, you know, I really well, thought- that's, why I, that's why I got it. I, I had COVID. Melinda and I both had it in February. And I would, I will tell you, my lungs are probably still not the same as they were before, right. but it was, I was, if you would have told me in January, are you going to get the, get the shot? I would have said, no, I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm not doing that. And the biggest reason I didn't want to get the shot was because you're going to tell me I have to get the shot. No, I'm not going to get it. And that was just, right. that was honestly, that's what I was thinking. And then I got it and I'm like, dude, this sucks. And I was worried about giving it to other people. That mm -hmm. part did worry me the whole time. I didn't want it to give it to you know, great grandma and she keels over from COVID. But after having it, man, it kicked my butt. I didn't have to go in the hospital, but my O2 was in the late eight, uh, low 80s right out of the gate. Mm. It was, man, it was scary. It was like, you're sitting there and you can't imagine having a strap around your chest. Yeah. And you just can't, you just can't get the oxygen that you need. Um, it was, it was crazy. So what do you think about the, so what do you think about the state of affairs in the U S where, I mean, do you think that you should have to have a, uh, a proof of your vaccination or do you think, I mean, what do you think about all this? Yeah. I, I, so I don't like it. I, I don't, and, and I've, I've said from the beginning and I, and I, I think I even touched on it in the blog that I did that if you come from, if you come at me from an angle of, uh, individual rights of legality, I have no, I have no argument. You say my, in my body, my choice, I don't want to get vaccinated. I have zero argument against you. You know, people that just say, look, it's my choice, you know, based on that, based on my interpretation of the data, I don't want to get vaccinated. I don't want my family to get vaccinated. You know, I wish they'd reconsider that. I want kids to be, but I don't have an argument against that. It's what, when I, when I have an argument against Tradition, both traditional anti-vaxxers and the, the new strain of COVID anti-vaxxers is, is don't try to come at it from a scientific angle because you're going to lose that. that. But when, when I hear people talk about vaccine passports and mandatory this and mandated that, I, I cringe and I, and I don't like that. You know, I, I want us to get have better messaging. Uh, there's just, there's so many layers to how this has gone wrong. You know, the CDs, it sees messaging. Okay, can, I, can I interrupt you real quick? Yeah. So, so you're in healthcare. Mm -hmm. 
and your hospital says you will be vaccinated to work here. And I see that as being different because then I'm a potential carrier. You know, and, no, and I see it as different too. I just, yeah. a lot of people are like, I, no, no, no. And it's like, no, there are times if yeah. you're working in healthcare, then you should, I, I believe you should do it. That's the way. I mean, yeah, maybe I, maybe I got a weird view, but I, w w so do you think that if, if, if I'm vaccinated, shouldn't I be protected from in both directions? Yeah, you should be. So if you are not protected, mm -hmm. I mean, you are obviously, but let's say that I'm around a person that's not vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Why am I worried about that? Uh, I'm not. You know, that's, I, I, I had that comment from somebody on social media today. They said, uh, why are the vaccinated afraid of the unvaccinated? I said, I'm not afraid of the unvaccinated. You know, that's, I'm, I'm around people all the time that I know are not vaccinated. And I'm fine with that because I, I know that I am vaccinated. It, yeah. And that's where it gets, it's just like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs yeah. because <laughs> You got us like we're flying in an airplane, mm -hmm. which we shouldn't be. If, if you're so worried about this, they shouldn't even let the airlines fly. If you're truthfully worried, they don't care about us. They care about making money. That's it. And then they threaten to you go on airplane, and they threaten you that if even if you're vaccinated, it's a federal law, mm -hmm. air quotes. Mm -hmm. It's not a federal law. As far as I know, I believe it's a mandate, yeah, a little bit a, different than a law, but still they are they are threatening you every time you get on an airplane if you don't put the, now they say it different so you got the homosexual dude telling you if you don't put your mask on you know we can it's federal law and there's fines and all this that sounds like a southern homo but you get the idea <laughs> anyway um i'm gonna get heat for saying homo i suppose but that's a that's actually a i found i, I did find it i got an email the other day no, a text from my buddy Chili. He says there's, what is it? LBQ, let's see. LBGTQ? Yeah, he, he said there's LGBT and S. And I'm like. Normal saline? No, Navy SEAL. <laughs> he, <laughs> he, told, he told me that one and I, I was rolling because he was dogging me out about my buddy, the Jack Carr, the writer, so. Anyway, I, I kind of went on a on a rant there. I'm sure people will be loving that. But man, let people just if you want to get vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you don't, don't get vaccinated. And if you die, that's terrible. But those of us that are vaccinated, guess what? We're going to die, too. That's just the way it is. Yeah, not, and not every shot of vaccine is going to be 100 percent, especially when you I said this book I'm reading. It's crazy when you start to understand how some of this stuff works, how a bacteria changes to match the virus to kill the virus. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. It's, cr it's, it's crazy what's going on. And this isn't something that a scientist created, right? This is something God created. Yeah. And, and we're trying to figure out how to put that into a vaccine to try to stop coronavirus. But it's, uh, I don't know a lot about DNA or RNA or CRISPRs or any of that stuff, but it, it, it just blows my mind that these people have somehow been able to unravel that, you know? Yeah. Unfortunately, like I say, the, the messaging has been terrible from the beginning, you know, and, and that's, and I get that all the time is I come at this from the science point of view. I come at this as a, from point of view, as a physician, as a healthcare provider, as a father, and then I get arguments back. Well, Fauci, I, I'm, I don't, I don't watch what Fauci says. I don't care what Fauci says. Yes, he's he's flip flop back and forth. Okay, I don't care. That's not what I'm. I'm talking about what I know to be true, not what Fauci said two months ago, which is you know what he said a week ago. Uh, I don't know anything about that, and I don't care. And I understand people are frustrated because the the messaging has been all over the map. They flip flop back and forth. They've, they've backtracked stuff. They've doubled down on stupid in a couple instances. And I understand how incredibly frustrating that is. And it, and it, and it pisses me off because now I have a harder time. And, and this, so, he, this, so this is kind of interesting. I had a, uh, 
a physician that, that I am social media friends with, not friends with in person, posted something that was, and I, and I make jokes about anti-vax, anti-vaxxers, but this was a little bit beyond the pale and what I would consider a, der- like a derogatory insult and lumping people into a group. And I called him out on it and a, and a bunch of other physicians rushed to defend him. And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. And I said, and I think the reason you don't understand is because you are so accustomed to only being around physicians. You've developed this elitist attitude. And what you don't understand is when you crap on that person with, with a whacked out conspiracy theory, rather than addressing them head on in a logical manner, you prove them right because you're dismissive. You just tell them to look at the science rather than explain the science. So then the two or three other people on the sideline who were kind of undecided, they're like, wow, that tinfoil hat guy, he's right. These guys are elitist and dismissive and they think we should just do what we tell them to do. So maybe I shouldn't take that vaccine. And those are the people that I'm trying to reach. Yeah, and follow the science. We we only follow the science when it, when it's uh, it improves our paycheck mm-hmm. or it puts us in control. Because if we were following the science, there'd be a lot of different things going on in America right now, but, but we're not, you know, and, and we're definitely not following the science. You said what Fauci said. Well, the good thing is you don't know what he said two months ago, and he don't know either because Apparently he's, not. Yeah, he's no. changed it several times. Yeah. And I, I feel like we need to get back. Um, we were just back in South Dakota. And it, maybe maybe this is going on everywhere. Well, actually, not maybe. It is going on everywhere. But I noticed it when I was back there because we're driving down Highway 81 in Watertown, South Dakota, and they've got a bunch of screens. So these businesses like to have these screens that you can change, you know, and instead of just a sign, it's got an LED screen or whatever so that they can tell what they're advertising. Almost every single one of those said, now hiring. Mm-hmm. Man, if America doesn't get back to work, we're going to be we're going to be screwed. We went into a restaurant while we're there and it said, please um, uh, uh, oh, how did it say it? There's something like basically you're trying to hire people. It says, don't be angry with the people that actually showed up at work. Right. So what I would say, and, and we all do this, Go into a restaurant. Where's my food? We go to the wait in line at the grocery store, whatever. Well, come on, you know, why don't you have any of these lines open? Mm -hmm. Well, be kind to those people that are there because guess what? They showed up for the game. Mm -hmm. It's the dirt bag that's getting 42,000. Maybe we're stupid because they're getting 42 grand (laughs) to sit on their butt. And we're out here trying to bust our hump to make that 42 grand. But bottom line is be kind to these people that are actually trying to work. And then let's get the rest of the people up and up and running, you know? Yeah. I was in uh, Charlotte for Soma last month and the restaurants there are just absolutely insane. It's, uh, you know, you know, two guys doing what normally there's six people doing and, uh, and trying to keep up with, with the customers and everything else. And I, and I, I feel for them, you know, it's, I, I'm definitely post COVID. I'm definitely, uh, I, I always tried to be a generous tipper. I think I'm even more of a generous tipper post COVID for just that reason that I recognize. Oh yeah. My wife chews me out. Like I'll put, you know, a 25% tip and she's like, what are you doing? And I go, that's too much. She goes, no, give her more, you know, or give him more. I mean, if they do a good job, give them a, give them a very good tip. Well, I I believe one thing I would like passed through the laws of, of those non-leaders up in DC would be if you go to a store and you got to use the self checkout, you should get discounts on your stuff. So I, I hear a lot of people say that I don't, I actually love the self checkout because I see my time as being valuable and I, I feel like I can get through a lot quicker using that. But, you know, I think, I think you might be onto something in the long term that maybe it's, you know, so if, if they put 5% discount on the self checkout line, I'll bet they could open up more self checkout lines. So the money that they would save, I mean, uh, I'd pay the extra five percent to go <laughs> and run through. <laughs> would you? Yeah, see, because here's what here's what be- always happens to me is if if I go in the regular checkout line, I get behind the little old lady who is the one of five people left in the continental United States paying with a checkbook. 
<laughs> that's awesome that she yeah, she doesn't have a debit card or she probably has one but doesn't know how to use it so she's pulling out the and she logs everything first and then writes the check and then and then tears it off and, and hands so it to the cashier that person does not bother me now in the in the hierarchy of how bent you get when you're at the store right little old lady is way 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 down here because mm -hmm. i i like little old ladies and i'm i'm good with that the first one is the dude that's healthy, that can work, that's walking upright and is buying his lunch and it's Reese's peanut butter cups and pop mm -hmm. and nothing good. Mm -hmm. And then he pays with an EBT card. Yeah. That one drives me absolutely. I don't know the dude's story, but it's sorry to lump all you dudes in there with EBT, EBT cards together, but it drives me insane and i'm like now i gotta get up here and pay my money yeah or and the, or well, the that's person not your money well actually no that is that is yeah, my money that's called yeah taxes or the people that park and walk into the store but then get the little scooter and it's like if you really needed the scooter you could you'd have a scooter right yeah you just you just don't want to walk yep my buddy johnny dog he says if he sees an able-bodied person, his wife had a major stroke, so he's got to help her with everything. Mm -hmm. And he pulls up to Walmart, and he's seeing the people that are parked in the, the handicap spots. And he's like, I'm actually the dude that needs to park there because my wife is in the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And he's walk, watching these people. He's like, oh, my goodness. And it just anyway, it'll drive you crazy. But, hey, I think we've, we've, we've solved most of the problems in the world. Just about. So <laughs> if you are – not a big fan of politicians. Mm -hmm. I know a good way you could change that. So I made a promise to my wife that I would not do that. And especially because it's become so vicious. And I, I don't want to say I have skeletons in my closet. I mean, I've got, you know, like anybody, I had a life. So um, there's some stuff, there's some stuff back there in the trunk. Uh, I'm not ashamed of any of it, but don't necessarily want to see it on the news beating me up every day. Um, and just, you know, dragging my family through the mud and, and again, how vicious yeah, people yeah. have become. Oh, I'm with you. you know, I'm with it's, you. and I, I, I did think about it and I've been, I've been approached locally. I've been approached on the state level that, Hey, you know, we can, with your, your, your military background and, uh, this, we could make this happen. And I'm like, no, I, you know, I've, I put the offer out there from everybody, you know, Governor Abbott, to Dan Crenshaw, and everybody in between. If you want somebody to come to a rally and get up there and speak for you, and and I, you know, I'll tell everybody where I came from, where I'm coming from, and yeah. and why I support you. I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to lend my voice to causes like that. But as far as me running, I don't think it's the right thing to do. Well, you got a lot of other stuff going on too. And I, I almost forgot to mention some of the other stuff. So your website, um, drmikesimpson.com. So dr and then mikesimpson.com. And then also Greybeard Performance. We, we did not get into that. Let's, let's cover that real quick so that folks understand what you got cooking there. Yeah. So Greybeard Performance is my life and lifestyle brand. It's also my line of supplements that I, I currently have two skews out now two supplements eventually going to progress that up to seven but it's it's kind of the companion for the book so you know the, the book is kind of your guide to navigate it and then i want the website to be where you get your supplements where you get your workout gear eventually i hope to have some workout plans on there um and start blogging again and and having some some more stuff that'll kind of reflect the life and lifestyle of the warrior athlete and that that'll all be at graybeardperformance.com so what, what are the, what's longevity? So the longevity formula is uh, basically vitamins and minerals, everything you need for healing. So seed, zinc, D3, turmeric, bioprin. So it's, uh, it's anti-inflammatory, pain reliever, and substrate that you need for, for recovery. Uh, it also gives you a little bit of an immune boost because of the vitamin C and the vitamin D and the zinc. But soft tissue repair is is really the reason that I came up with that because I wanted something that was going to help me recover more quickly. So I, I didn't have to 
to Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the gym that I could go Monday through Friday if I wanted to and, and know that my body had the substrate to repair itself. That was the, the impetus for the longevity formula. That's by far my most popular out of the two. And energy formula, what is that? Energy formula, I didn't like traditional pre-workouts. I think a lot of them were what I call dirty. They had a lot of bad stuff in them. Uh, I didn't like the way they made me feel. So I uh, put together a formulation with some amino acids and some B vitamins and came up with the energy formula. Uh, I find that if I take it 30 minutes before a workout, even in the evening, I feel focused. I feel very energetic. And there's not a crash at the end. And also, even, even if I go to jujitsu 6 o'clock at night, take it right before class, uh, I don't come home and then, oh, my gosh, my my energy formula is still kicked in and I can't go to sleep. I, I can go to sleep just fine. I, I, several guys that I train with say that they stop their pre-workouts entirely and are just using the energy formula. So longevity, is that meant for just old dudes or is that meant for everybody? It, the stuff that's in it, anybody could take. A, a man can take it. A, I do have, I have some female clients that take it. Uh, it's every, if you don't want to be taking vitamin M for Motrin, all the time. You know, this has turmeric. That's a natural alternative for that. Um, so, uh, and it's going to help you with, with your recovery. Stop there. Say that again. So turmeric, which is in mustard, right? Uh, it's in a lot of things. Yeah. It's, it's so, so explain the, the, the correlation to, to yeah, Motrin. Uh, yeah. Turmeric is an, is a natural anti-inflammatory. So whereas, you know, Motrin oh, is, wow, okay. Motrin is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Uh, that's, you know, regulated by the FDA and is in drug over the counter drug format. Uh, turmeric is a natural alternative to that. And it's also supposedly good for your brain, right? A uh, little bit of brain effects. The jury's kind of still out on the trials. That's why I don't, I, in the book, I don't think I listed those trials specifically other than, uh, there, there is some increased blood flow effect. Well, cool. Anything else we need to know? Uh, no, just buy the book. And if you have any questions, go to greatbeardperformance.com and you can scroll down and, and send me a message. And I, I'm usually pretty quick about answering all of those inquiries. Uh, follow Greatbeard Performance on Instagram. And follow me, Dr. Mike Simpson, on Instagram as well. Buy the book, read the book. Live the and life. He's going to, he's going to do some more blogging. I am. You guys heard him say that. I did when you read that. these blogs, you're going to love them. They're <laughs> they're uh, they're awesome. I mean, they're what I like about them is th these are they're edgy and they make you think a little bit. You 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 don't hold back when you uh, when you blog, and I really like that because it's some I get and it's like oh this is you know we don't want to offend anybody. You yeah. have no problem saying exactly what's on your mind, and I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much, man, for uh, for joining us here. Thank and you. Uh, I can't wait to see what you got cooking in that next book as well. Um, and one important thing, thank you so much for your service. 32 years in the military, in the military. That is, that is awesome. And man, we thank you so much for that. Thank you, Kyle. I appreciate it. All right, folks, check out the book honed finding your edge as a man over 40. It's uh, it starts out and it kind of reads like a thriller novel. <laughs> And then it starts giving you some guidance and it's, it's stuff that we can actually do. It's not something that, that the normal 40 plus year old can't, it's stuff that we all can do to, to, to keep, you know, stay in the fight as long as we possibly can. All right, folks, if you would send emails to uh, lamb at vikingtactics.com If you have any comments, we've been getting a lot of great comments on the leadership uh, podcast and on the other podcast, but the leadership ones have really got y'all spun up there a little bit. So that's good. And, uh, we read every email. We don't answer every one of those, but we read every one of them. And we really appreciate that, uh, that feedback there. One of the books I mentioned, I haven't finished this book yet, but the code breaker, I've been reading this book about, um, Jennifer Dodna or something like that is her name. It, it's, I'm, if you have a hard time reading history books, you probably don't want to pick up this book, but if you're interested to hear what these scientists have went through, it's, I found it very, very interesting. So, uh, and I'm not finished with it yet. I think I know how the story ends, but it's uh, it's been a good read for me. It's put me in a kind of a different space in history because it is history what these scientists have done 
all across the country, all across the world, um, even in Wisconsin, making making bacteria to kill viruses in yogurt. And it's something that's been applied. And those those scientists figured out stuff that could help us to uh, to fight COVID and other other viruses. All right. That's all I got. Thanks for joining us. Give us a five star review if you would or a thumbs up there if you watch this on YouTube. And last but not least, the most important thing. God bless America.